Thank you very much for joining us. Happy World Town Planning Day. Um, and it's lovely to see so many of you online. My name is Jessica Schmidt, and I'm an urban specialist with the World Bank, as well as one of the co-leads of the APA's International Division's new Climate and Sustainability Working Group. Um, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers who will discuss their experiences connecting intergenerational equity and resilient sustainable development. Um, and we'll discuss how planning for climate adaptation can also advance social inclusion. You'll also hear several case studies which focus on underrepresented groups and learn how to enact inclusive climate action in urban areas. Um, so we have a lot on the plate today. Um, hopefully uh, we can have some time for some Q&A at the end. Um, and thank you all again for being here. Our first presenter is Linda Shi, an assistant professor of city and regional planning at Cornell University. Linda studies barriers to coastal climate adaptation, how cities are adapting, and the impacts of their adaptation efforts on social and spatial inequality across the global North and South. She has worked for AECOM, the Institute for International Development and the Rocky Mountain Institute, and has consulted with the World Bank and the American Institute of Architects on projects in the US, Latin America, and Africa. She has degrees from Yale, Harvard, and MIT. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much, Linda, uh, for being here. Um, if you uh, will hand it over to you now, uh, please let me know if you have any technical issues, um, but thank you again. Thanks so much, Jessica. Hi, everyone. Great to be with you on World Town Planning Day. Good evening, I assume, to most of you, uh, except for any intrepid people from Asian time zones. So I'm, I'm honored to speak on this topic of climate equity and the intersection with inter, uh, intergenerational equity. And um, I've titled my slides here, Unlearning Climate Action and Relearning Climate Justice. The picture that you see here is of the Kumbh Mela, which is a major pilgrimage festival in, uh, in India celebrating Hinduism. It's a cycle that is every 12 years um, and it uh, celebrates the revolution of Jupiter, the planets, and there are four major river sites where people go. Um, and it was inspired in the eighth century, but I think they started celebrating it in the 19th century. And uh, two years ago, this led to 50 million people gathering at the banks of a river. So it's one of the world's lar largest pilgrimages. And I start off with this picture because I think it epitomizes some of the core questions that we have. And I should preface my um, talk by saying that I don't necessarily have answers, but raise questions and perspectives for all of us to discuss. So the Kumbh Mela is often taken as a incredible feat of ingenuity and city construction because in India, which is otherwise not known for incredibly great planning and efficiently working cities, people construct over the per a period of a month, um, a city that is able to accommodate 50 million people. There are permanent structures or semi-permanent structures. There's electricity, there's sanitation, there's a whole governance structure that comes about to produce this. And this was the inspiration of Harvard GSD's um, work taking students from Harvard. They brought drones. They did all of the studies to write this book on the Comella, which produced this picture that you see before you. And sometimes this has taken them to ask, why can't we use similar kinds of approaches to build the permanent sides of cities to be as good? Why do we have slum settlements in India when it's possible to create something this incredible in such a short time? Um, but I think it's also possible to flip this question and look at it in the opposite perspective. Instead of perceiving this event as something that is ephemeral, but to consider this as something that is enduring because the celebration of the rivers comes from a spiritual relationship to nature, to other people, to past lives and their potential for changing your impact, your future lives. So speaking of intergenerational equity, your actions will specifically remedy or repair your past harms and your future uh, repercussions and future lives. 
And what we see in our built cities actually is an act of disposable nature, uh, an understanding that both cities, some cities, peoples are disposable, whose lives we neither care about, whose resilience is not measured, and whose outcomes um, are not necessarily worthy of investment because they do not count for certain attributes that we do care about. And so I think that as we uh, consider what kinds of climate actions that we should be promulgating in the act of, in the face of um, the disasters that are bringing us to this table, to this conversation, we have to think more broadly beyond the immediate questions of intergenerational equity in terms of the present moment or our grandparents to our children, to our grandchildren, but even more broadly to how we connect the current moment with historic ways of living with nature as we think about really what we could be doing in the future. So, um, Getting a little bit more specific, we know that the issues of climate change are extremely inequitable in their causes. What you see here in this map is a map of the total amount of carbon emissions estimated to have been produced by country, um, I think his, like it, in, in, since 1750, it says here. So even though China this year is, or in the last few years has produced more than the United States, on the whole, the United States, with just a small portion of the world's population, 4% uh, most recently, has reduced a disproportionate amount of carbon emissions. So the causes of climate change are inequitable around the world. Um, I can give an estimate, I'll share that when I was an intern over a decade ago in Sasaki Associates, I made it a summer project to estimate Sasaki's total carbon emissions, including their transportation emissions of, of uh, flights from airfare to all the different project sites. And while Sasaki was touting itself as a very green institution, it produced more carbon emissions than in the country of Mali. And I do this not to, uh, not to cast shade on Sasaki, but to show how writ small, writ large, no matter whether we tout ourselves as being uh, particularly green or taking great measures, that these inequalities date far back and are quite extreme. And at the same time, the environmental injustices of the fossil fuel-backed capitalism have also been extremely inequitable, where particular countries that have been the sources of natural resource extraction in order to enable a fossil fuel form of capitalism and the kinds of harms borne by communities living around places of processing and waste disposal are also unjust. This accumulation of wealth inequality over time also creates inequalities when it comes to negotiating at, uh, at the events like COP26, such that well-equipped countries are able to bring uh, uh, large teams of people who are able to work around the clock and to ensure that their interests are met relative to the demands of other countries. And finally, there is, of course, an inequitable burden of the cost of decarbonization. I had, in, in my, for my house, an estimate this summer that it would cost $40,000 to take my house off of natural gas and put in a heat pump and create a parallel ducted system of a 100-year-old uh, radiator house. So the costs of decarbonization are going to be borne inequitably across communities with many uh, unable countries and communities unable to bear some of these costs on their own. At the same time, the impacts of climate change themselves are highly inequitable. What you see here is a recent study that estimated the change in land suitability around the world. So in the top map, you see in current conditions, the relative suitability of different parts of the world for human habitation. In the middle map, you see that map uh, under higher estimates or of, uh, climate emission, of carbon emissions following the trends that we already are, have been going on. And you see that the suitability of different environments shifts dramatically to the upper parts of the Northern hemisphere and a bit to the lower parts, but there's just not as much of a land mass in the Southern hemisphere. Um, and so the last map shows the net gain or net loss of suitability change. And what we can see is that those countries that have emitted by far the fewest carbon emissions will see the worst impacts of climate change in terms of desertification, high heat loss, drought, um, and fire. 
In turn, there is a significant inability among these uh, poor countries and poor people within any particular country to adapt to or to recover from the impacts of a disaster. And in turn, also greater exposure and uh, less ability to deal with the adaptation of others. And I'm gonna speak a little bit more about that. And so it becomes very clear that the number one priority for adaptation is necessarily decarbonization. But here too, we see that even as we are attempting to decarbonize our economies, that we are engaging in, in equitable approaches to doing that. So in some places, efforts to decarbonize means taking some of those polluting industries and moving them around, even if the net is lower, if the concentration of where they take place still have environmental injustices. In the upper picture, you can see that uh, industries that have been in Beijing are moved to other places like Tangshan, um, so that while we go to these bigger, more prominent cities that people are more likely to travel to and more uh, elite people are more likely to live in, many other places are not necessarily receiving that same benefit. Similarly, in places like California, the approach taken to cap and trade meant that community, that uh, industries that were able to pay for um, the right to pollute and to continue to emit carbon um, were able to continue doing so, even if they did so and had to draw down those emissions over time, the communities that were living near coal-fired fire, uh, coal power plants continued to be subject to higher rates of air pollutant, asthma, and respiratory illness. There's inequitable access to new green jobs. Key in point, one might look at West Virginia and communities that um, it were the environmental injustice sites of past rounds of fossil fuel based capitalism and now are left behind as we shift to a new form of energy economy and do not necessarily have access and are politically powerful enough to block nationwide progress on that. But many other communities may not have access to those kinds of jobs or those shifts in the economies and be, uh, be fearful of being left behind. Disadvantaged communities also have fewer rights to green spaces. Now that we're talking about nature-based solutions and urban greening, uh, remediating urban heat islands through tree planting, for instance, lots of communities like those in central Los Angeles historically have been uh, have had very little access to green space. And the fact that we tend to plant trees in places that already have grass on them because it's easier to plant trees in parks means that those communities that are surrounded with very little space for trees and parks have less access to the new technologies of, um, of planning and environmentalism. And again, there's an inequitable burden on costs of who is able to pay, who is able to afford the health care and impacts of climate, impact, uh, of climate change. In a parallel way, uh, when we talk about climate adaptation, we also see increasing examples of exclusionary resilience. So for instance, when I started studying climate adaptation, the impetus was mostly to get cities to adapt with the assumption that any form of adaptation would necessarily be progressive and desirable. But as we see cities undertaking climate change uh, adaptation strategies and touting themselves as resilient cities, we are, unsurprisingly, when you push, uh, let's say, a new form of meat through a sausage maker, you still get sausage, even if it's of a different variety. So you see here in the picture is a photo that I took in downtown Manila along the Pasig River, where you can see these uh, slum dwellers living in uh, very vulnerable places. And they live there because the city has not ever made affordable housing and social housing a central priority. In, in its allocation of land to private developers. And so the city is covered with giant malls and suburban housing developments, but not enough space for the many people who come in part because trade agreements and other land practices have made farming and agriculture in their home places impossible. And so when they come here and there's a disaster, the city's uh, strategy for remedying this is to resettle households where there is available land. In the United States, we'll talk about uh, flood buyouts. Here, it's a more forceful approach through um, whole community relocation. Um, this is something that is less often done in the United States. But you can see that because of where land is available, they are resettled in places in the far periphery, far from those urban centers, where there is an absence of jobs and opportunities. And this uh, plays out in a different way in the United States as well. 
we don't have these whole community relocations, which means there's not necessarily a preservation of social ties, nor do we track where, where people go, but they are dispersed and oftentimes dispersed to places that continue to be vulnerable, both socioeconomically and climatologically. There is also a, a sense of a, a zero sum resilience between urban and rural communities. So urban communities might tout themselves as resilient cities, but all of the inflows and outflows that cities have, their inputs of water and energy come from other places outside of the city, their waste flows similarly go outside of the city. And so if climate change begins to impact all of those supplies, the fact that cities may want to secure more water resources for themselves or to push wastewaters or floodwaters onto other communities necessarily implicates regional landscapes, but we rarely measure our resilience in those regional or networked capacities. Um, and so when we think about having urban resilience, does it come at the expense of others? And are those others well-being even measured or cared about when we, when we consider adaptation planning? So the question really, I think that you all want to know is what should we do to deal with some of these negative repercussions? And I'm looking forward to the presentations by others to offer some of these ideas and I'll just relay a few of my own. One is that many people working in environmental justice, community organizing, they have a lot to say on this and they have already said it in many of these kinds of white papers and public reports that are available on the web. In one of my recent papers, I took a look at these and I coded them to try to summarize what are some of the key issues that people talk about when they advocate if you wanna do actually equitable resilience or um, inclusive adaptation, what might be some of the measures that you ought to be engaging in? Unsurprisingly, most of the measures are talking about changing procedural equity because you cannot get to a change in distribution without changing the process or changing how the sausage is made. So a lot of these focus on changing government attitudes, including getting governments to recognize the ways in which public regulations and planning strategies have historically led to these kinds of inequitable outcomes and, and harms. There is talk about building political power and the leadership capacity of community organizations in order to engage in a fair way and uh, in a level playing field, even when they are invited to the table. And that includes building communities technical capacity to understand the issues that climate change adds on top of the existing burdens that communities have to deal with, such as policing, um, evictions, health and education. And finally, there's an effort to talk about plan reforming planning processes so that they are equitably um, including communities, paying for communities involvement as well. A subset of people also talked about redistributing and prioritizing disadvantaged groups. So if all of these past, pro past uh, projects that I'm talking about have deprioritized communities or made the benefits not necessarily ones that uh, disadvantaged communities have access to, then the necessary outcome or the opposite approach would be to prioritize them in getting uh, benefits first in line. So for instance, Houston's new uh, bond uh, that they passed for $2 billion, the approach is to prioritize the worst first so that those who have historically not gotten the benefits are going to, uh, going to be prioritized for investments now. Much less people talk about regulating the private sector, for instance, through new taxes to generate revenues that we can better distribute or even have approaching it through collective or other property rights regimes. And very few people actually talk about structural reforms. And I think this is a key one where we need to put more of our minds and thoughts because the kinds of racism, colonialism, inequality, all of that is built into our land governance institutions. Those rather than individual choices are the ones that dictate the kinds of development that we put in place, the availability of housing, the places where housing can be built, uh, what kinds of housing and so forth. And those kinds of things um, are very difficult to change because they're built into our assumptions, our mindsets of what a well-governed society should be. But short of, without changing that, I think it's very difficult to get towards the broader distributive and procedural equity that we hope to see. Um, so I guess if we look at intergenerational equity, I think that um, we don't necessarily even have to look towards the future. We can look towards the past 
and consider what kinds of injustices, intergenerational injustices have been sanctioned by law. And before we ask, how can we better have better slums or ghetto be, be climate proof? We can ask why these communities historically have been deprived of adequate shelter and housing, why land allocations favor upper income and elite developments. And then we already have some of our answers as to how we should be changing moving forward. Um, very quickly, I think that we also think need to think about the ideas that we use and whose ideas we elevate in touting a new generation of climate leaders. We're very quick to jump to places like the Netherlands as thought leaders in uh, uh, whether it's gray infrastructure like water squares and the dike infrastructure or greener infrastructure like living with, with water and this kind of polder landscape. Why do we admire these landscapes uh, instead of perhaps the Bali rice terraces, which date back to about 2000 years of Indonesian and Indian thinking? And there are examples of this and in the, in the Philippines, Ifugao, that are UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Many people, most people around the world have examples where they have long lived with water in ways that are not only technologies, but also spiritual dimensions as well as social governance dimensions. So the Balinese rice terraces, for instance, are collectively governed and collectively managed in order to democratically and equitably distribute the food resources in a place that has a high concentration of populations. We often look to the Netherlands, but we could also look to East Kolkata, where there's 48 square miles of wetlands. That is a world Ramsar wetland site. This system of wetlands well, is uh, able to treat a third of the city's sewage. It has fish ponds, agriculture, aquaculture, and employs something like 20,000 people. Um, and so I think that as we consider the uh, sites of knowledge production and new places of technological innovation that then become the centers for uh, a whole livelihood, a whole economy and machine to disseminate consulting and other services we need to ask why nature-based solutions from Europe or the United States are the ones being elevated rather than the low-tech or uh, traditional environmental ecological knowledge of traditional peoples living worldwide. And finally, I would say that a much harder um, step is to consider how do we shift the modes of economy that we have. And this is a, a, a diagram that's put together by Climate Justice Alliance about shifting our world from one of that is an extractive economy to a regenerative economy that pulls down not only carbon, but also wealth and power to the grassroots systems because people who live off of the land that they depend on are much more likely to care for and nurture those systems. So as all of us go forward to engaging in the planning work that we do, I also want us to question whether we need to be importing and engaging in fast policy transfers and learning that while on the one hand, very important, also on the other hand, perhaps negates some of the learning that has been happening within our own cities of disadvantaged communities who have long been neglected and who have worked for decades, if not for centuries to survive and thrive in this state of uh, uncertainty and, um, and vulnerability that the rest of us now find ourselves in. And that brings me back to where I started and considering that um, as we move forward, perhaps we're not necessarily looking for the latest, greatest way of engaging in climate action to build these new, beautiful, shining, ephemeral places, but elevating the kinds of traditional knowledge that is deep rooted in the world and that has been there throughout the many centuries of colonial extraction experience. Thanks very much and looking forward to the conversation with all of you. Thank you so much, Linda. That was fantastic. Um, and your insightful perspective and questions, I think, will lead to a lot of conversation later on. Um, the Climate Justice Alliance's components of the regenerative um, economy, I think, I, we hope we can touch on later on as well. Our next speaker will illustrate some case studies of how to design for intergenerational equity. Our next speaker is Zach Postone. Zach is an urban planner with Arabs New York office. He brings experience in project management, research, and community engagement from public, private, and nonprofit sectors. His skills include GIS mapping and visualization, policy research, planning analysis, zoning and land use, and urban design. 
Zach is committed to translating complex urban issues into accessible analysis and graphic communication to inform planning decisions and identify solutions. Zach has worked with design and urbanism uh, organizations, including the MIT Civic Data Design Lab, Van Allen Institute, and New York City Department of City Planning. He holds a master's in city planning from MIT. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Zach, um, and take it away. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, I'll share my screen just to make sure. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. All right, well, hi everyone. Uh, really excited to be here as part of this conversation and to participate in World Town Planning Day. Um, I'm Zach, as, as you mentioned, I'm a planner at, um, at Arup, which is a global firm of planners, designers, engineers, and consultants delivering built environment projects around the world. And today I'll be focusing on two projects that relate to Arup Cities Alive program which is a series of global research and events that explore major trends and drivers that are shaping future cities. And this work really spans um, a wide range of topics from um, pedestrian planning to green infrastructure to designing for arid climates. Um, but today, um, the first project I'll be focusing on is one of these publications, which was um, designing for aging communities. And so this publication focuses in on the, the dual trend of, of rapid urbanization and the growth of the population over 60, um, sort of exploring what that um, intersection of trends means for how we design and plan cities and what that means for practitioners and decision makers and stakeholders. And so um, this work is um, sort of structured around defining and exploring the core needs of aging populations and then um, investigating high-level strategies, specific actions for decision makers and stakeholders to take, and then um, around 40 case studies from around the world demonstrating these principles um, in action. And so um, this slide just shows the, the four major themes that um, the work is organized around. Um, uh, there's obviously a lot of overlap and um, intersection between these, but um, so the work is loosely grouped into autonomy and independence, health and well-being, social connectedness, and security and resilience. And so this slide just shows um, the uh, the strategies sort of grouped underneath each each theme. And I guess one thing I'd point out here is, um, you know, under the security and resilience section, you can see that this work um, focused a bit more on preparing for extreme climates and um, some safety related design interventions, but um, you know, particularly highlighted by um, the experience of the pandemic over the last two years, I think we've all seen um, the critical role that uh, access to health services, access to outdoor spaces um, and social infrastructure for uh, civic participation and, uh, and communication uh, play in addressing disaster situations. And so I will flip through these slides quickly in the interest of time because um, they're all included in the, in the publication, but just to give an overview of some of the uh, types of case studies included in this work. Autonomy and independence really centers on effectively navigate urban environments and, and retain mobility throughout one's lifetime. Um, including policy mechanisms that encourage um, walkable and transit-rich neighborhoods, and then specific design techniques that can be implemented at the, the building or um, sort of streetscape scale. Under health and well-being, um, this, this covers strategies that, that um, focus on access as well as a range of, of outdoor um, and nature-based spaces to um, you know, increase access to health services as well as um, retain that connection to nature. And this, this section includes, you know, cases from, you know, residential developments that really um, include a unique mix and intersection of, of, of services all at one location to um, individual facilities that really incorporate um, nature-based and biophilic principles into the design itself. Um, under social connectedness, uh, this includes both sort of new forms of, of 
of living together and um, housing models, as well as uh, forums for um, for uh, civic participation and involvement of older populations in um, city governance. And then under security and resilience, in addition to climate related uh, safety and um, security, the publication also focuses on a range of aspects, including uh, streetscape, streetscape safety. And so in this, in this work, I mean, the goal of this work is really to provide a lens for um, decision makers, um, you know, stakeholder groups, planners to, to sort of approach the multifaceted nature of, of designing for aging populations and then to be able to um, pinpoint and, and draw upon the learnings of specific case studies and, and identify tangible actions that, um, that can be taken to advance those principles. And all right, so the second project that I'll, I'll highlight is actually rooted in another um, Cities Alive publication. Um, this one emerged from a Cities Alive report, which was released in 2017, um, uh, designing for urban childhoods. And the focus of this, uh, of this work was really to explore um, the universal and inclusive design philosophy that if we create cities and environments for children, we can create successful cities for all people. And uh, this emerged as a collaboration um, between Angela Kyle, who runs a nonprofit called Playbuild in New Orleans, um, and Arup, um, as well as local stakeholders, including the Mayor's Office of Youth and Families and academic institutions, um, including the uh, Tulane School for Sustainable Real Estate. And so the goal of this work was really to bring um, multiple stakeholders together that hadn't um, hadn't yet sort of collaborated on this issue and to try to align around a common vision for what um, child-friendly planning and design meant in the New Orleans context and to produce a visual shareable uh, output to kind of communicate that narrative um, more broadly. And I guess some of the motivating, you know, the motivating factors for this work um, were, you know, some of the statistics shown here 40% of, of youth in New Orleans live in poverty and Louisiana ranks 49th in terms of child well-being in the United States. And so the structure of this work was um, catalyzed initially through um, an in-person series of workshops uh, between Arab's foresight and integrated planning teams, um, co-hosted with a range of community organizations and city agencies as well as um, a range of, of youth participants to um, engage them on their direct experiences navigating, navigating the city. And um, this built on some of the frameworks, you know, the high level um, uh, sort of thematic groupings that were identified in the Cities Alive report, but sort of used that as scaffolding to um, explore um, the needs of, of participants in, in the local context. And I think, you know, this also included mapping um, mapping the experience that people had navigating their daily routes um, in the city. And I think one of the key sort of takeaways from this was that, you know, while we were able to draw upon um, sort of high level principles from, from the Cities Alive work, this just really showed the importance of, you know, localizing that type of, of, of knowledge. And while a lot of the original publication had emphasized things like playable infrastructure Many of the concerns that were really surfaced in this in this work um, were around, you know, basic safety, walking down the street, and uh, going outside. And so, again, this work sort of um, coalesced into a a, a series of eleven goals that the Office of Youth and Families wanted to prioritize, and then four goals within that that they wanted to elevate, um, um, sort of in the forefront which were uh, creating safe routes, safe streets and walkable New Orleans, uh, transforming blight into play spaces, creating new and strengthening existing access to nature, recreation and water, and establishing communications and awareness strategies and platforms. And so, you know, the goal of this work was really about, um, you know, alignment of this range of stakeholders and, and coming together to define sort of core principles that would unify this work. And one of the, one of the tools that they uh, you know, wanted from, from this work was, was a visual, accessible, sort of creative and playful way to communicate these principles. 
And so part of this work um, involved the development of sort of a large scale infographic that, that summarized a lot of the, the strategies included in our, um, you know, that emerged through our workshops and um, other forums. And it kind of gave them a sort of visual, visual device and visual language to begin um, communicating this more broadly through presentations and, and zooming in and, and, you know, to have graphic assets for um, presentations and workshops and, and publications. And so um, the, the work from these, uh, these workshops and uh, the illustrations were packaged together into a short booklet, which was used as part of a, a neighborhood summit in New Orleans in November of 2019. Uh, which was again a, a collaboration of a range of city agencies and community representatives. Um, and the, this work really led into a broader process of the Office for Youth, the Office of Youth and Families development of a youth master plan. Um, and oh, some of the themes that were surfaced through this work, particularly around um, transportation and street safety, um, were you know, further developed through the Youth Master Plan. And at the moment, the New Orleans DOT is working to implement some of the strategies that were um, outlined in this publication and through the Youth Master Plan. And so um, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, this, this, again, is just some examples of, of, you know, from two ends of the age spectrum, how um, some of this broader, more thematic research has connected to our um, on the ground projects and how we've taken taken that um, sort of guidance for stakeholders, um, decision makers in city government, um, community groups, and integrated that into into project work. And um, yeah, again, the, the publication from the New Orleans work, as well as all of the city's alive publications, are accessible online. And uh, also, feel free to reach out to me with with any questions. Thank you so much, Zach. That was fantastic. I was actually in Toyama a few years ago, and its unique approach to planning for the elderly um, has design implications that are also beneficial to a tourist carrying luggage, uh, luggage to children, um, you know, anyone pushing um, or carrying things. And it's made the city extremely walkable and livable. It was a wonderful experience. Um, but carrying on the theme of people-centered planning, our next speaker is Jana Elhor. Jana is a senior social development specialist with the World Bank with extensive experience working on gender, social inclusion, and fragility, conflict, and violence. She has designed and implemented multiple community-driven development projects in different regions, including Africa and South Asia, um, including projects with a strong climate resilience focus. Prior to the bank, she worked in Iraq and Lebanon on various programs, including supporting women's small and medium enterprises, displacement, and reintegration of ex-combatants. Jana holds a PhD in conflict analysis from George Mason University, and a bachelor's in economics from the American University of Beirut. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you, Jana. Um, if you have any issues with the sharing your screen, just let me know. Sorry, just a second. I don't use Zoom that much. Um, sorry, do you see my screen? Uh, we can see it, yeah. If so if you just but, wanna maximize. Um... Uh, yes, so I need to put it in a slide mode, right? That's the yep. issue you see, okay. Perfect. There you go. I apologize for that. Um, oh, you're, see it, you're seeing it now in a... Not yet. So I'm trying, yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out why it's happening. Okay. There we go. Thank yeah. you. I apologize for that. Um, at the World Bank, we, we rarely use Zoom. <laughs> And so I, every time I use it, it's like as if the first time I use it. But um, so first of all, uh, thank you so much for the introduction. And I'm really happy to be present with all of you today, even just online um, on this World Town Planning Day. Um, I, as you heard from Jessica's introduction, I am not a planner, nor an urban expert. Um, and I really hope that, that the discussion today really fits what you, um, are anticipating. I have to say I've been a little bit concerned uh, not knowing how to frame today's discussion because I think 
for me, I always, given my background, my studies, I'm, I, I present myself more of a sociologist. I always think of thinking about how do we deal with life problems while putting people at the center of those problems. So if you're looking at climate change and the reality that we have with it, how do we put people and communities at the center of the climate action? Um, it's not something pretty. It's, it's not a cookie cutter approach. It always goes, um, uh, it depends on context. It depends on a lot of things. And so my pre I, I really love what the two other presenters had, had shared and I love that work. So, um, and I've learned a lot. And so I, I hope that with this presentation, we can complement what has been discussed and, and really look at some of the people-centered approach, especially on the first presentation of what we had discussed um, in terms of thinking about interventions. Um, and so often, before I start the presentation, often the questions that I get um, are, are often about, okay, if we're thinking about urbanization, we will think about improved services in urban centers, we'll think about improved livability for, for jobs and, and mobility, and therefore people are at the center of it. And I often, my response is always often that's not sufficient. We always need, that means you're looking at people on, at the second degree. You're thinking more first about the planning of, of, of what you want to do, and then you're thinking about how people fit within that. Um, and I feel I, I always advise our teams and the work that I'm doing right now on how do we ask the questions with the people focused. So a lot of the examples you'll hear me provide are now mostly focused on Africa because this is where most of my work is and I'll try to bring in some of the examples from East Asia but um, I will draw in on examples from different places to show you how we do different things. And so how I, I will go about my presentation to first of all to talk about how do we think how to approach about thinking about people and communities how do we think about them in different um, aspects or different dimensions um, then we'll move to discuss a little bit why people and communities should be at the center of the climate actions. And then we will conclude with what questions or maybe programs or policies we want to include in our analysis when thinking of planning for a climate resilient future. So how, um, how to think about people. And I often, one of the things that I often ask um, our teams that were on, work on climate is I asked them, who are the vulnerable people and where do they live? Before you start thinking about what policy actions you want to do, those are the two main questions I want you to start with. Because when we start thinking about who are the vulnerable people, we need to start thinking more about gender. So thinking about elderly, thinking about women, thinking about girls. We want to think about demographics, we want to think about young people, we want to think about the elderly. We want to think about livelihoods, we want to think about farmers, we want to think about herders, we want to think about pastoralists, but also we want to think about uh, delivery people, like takeout delivery people, we want to think about Uber drivers, we want to think about taxi drivers, and then spatial. Where are they living, basically? Are they living in rural areas, in urban areas? Where are they living in the urban areas? Are they living in areas where there are high levels of violence? Because then we need to, to or there are high levels of crime, because then we need to think if we have some kind of climate shock, what that means to issues of violence and crime. If they are living in rural areas and there are more increased, there are like more fragility or conflict in those areas, what does that mean? to adding layers of multiple climate shocks. The reason why we keep asking why or who are the vulnerable and where are they living? Because you, you want to start to better understand their challenges. We want to start understanding their, not only their challenges, but what the opportunities are to start including them in any policy or planning you want to do. As I mentioned earlier, often we think about the planning first and then we think about the people as, as, as often the 
the beneficiaries of this planning, but we want to think about them as the center of the planning um, because you are taking their challenges and their opportunities to be the guide for the planning. Why is this important? I'm going to give you some examples from Cameroon. This is currently something I'm working with. Um, and I wanted to share that with you. And uh, these are some very, very new calculations we just did two, two weeks ago. So um, we might refine them a little bit, but we looked at, we took the country of Cameroon and <clears throat> we looked at some of the drought and heat stress, uh, the high levels of drought and heat stress. And we saw them and, 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 and we, we had a map, I'm, I'm not showing you step-by-step step here, but we had a map where we had extreme heat and drought stress, mainly in, in the far north area of, of, of Cameroon um, and the east and west of Cameroon, where if you see here on the left side where I have the circles around them. But this is, um, so we, we did that. We, we, we looked at the drought and heat stress to better understand where the regions that are most impacted by climate. And then we, the two things we first of all looked at developed a social inclusion index where we looked and at, at indicators of people's access to labor markets to human capital opportunities like education and health um, people's access to services like roads digital services financial services and mechanisms and people's access to mechanisms of social cohesion and community participation and resilience. So what we looked at is people's reliance on uh, um, remittances, uh, people's participation in community organizations, people's participation in elections, people's participation in protests. And we saw that in these areas where we had these high levels of climate risks, they, there were very low levels of social inclusion. So in this left side of the, of the screen, you'll see the, we'll see the compounded impact of these high levels of climate risks with low levels of social inclusion. And they are, and, and this, the, they became grayer, the compounded risk became grayer because you had um, the social inclusion actually index was a lot lower in these two specific regions. And we said, okay, let's also look at poverty. And so we, we took on the right side, you'll see a map of where you have um, high levels of poverty and high levels of climate risks. And also it is in the Northern region. So you'll see here, there's a, there's a story of saying that there are people's capacity to, financial capacity to overcome shocks and also people's capacity to several, several, um, uh, several opportunities for, in, for inclusion to also cope and be resilient to shocks are very low in the areas where we have high levels of shocks. And, and, and this is quite interesting when we start looking at what does that mean for the next 10 to 30 years. If we look at, if we start looking at migration induced uh, climate induced migration in Africa West overall. We look, if, if you'll see here on the, on the right side, I've put the map of Africa West in general. But if I, if I take the Cameroon example that we just were talking about here on the right side, um, you'll see that has been in the areas of the West where I was talking about with low levels of social inclusions and high levels of climate risk, you'll see that there is an increased out migration. It means that these populations here, in the next 10 to 30 years, here you're seeing the image of 30 years, but I didn't have the data of 10 years. I just didn't calculate it for this presentation, unfortunately. And so between now and 30 years, you'll see more and more people are actually leaving these areas. And we see why these are more on the, on the, on the coast. So they're probably impacted by more climate shocks. Um, and there are other, the climate shocks more and more internally are more focused, making people leave, get out of these areas. But if we look at the North, we see where we had the low levels of poverty and we had high levels of climate shock, we see an increased in migration of people. And, and the way that we've calculated this uh, migration is um, this uh, climate-induced migration. We looked at 
people's movement for farming, for livelihood opportunities, for um, for uh, social ties, etc. And so we built it on a trend of the last 30 years with taking into consideration different climate shocks and we have built this for the next 30 years. So when we look at something like this and we know the capabilities of people in these areas and we know what could be potentially happening with the climate induced migration. But before, so we don't look at it as a challenge, but we look at it as more as an opportunity. How do we start preparing? How do we, do we minimize the out-migration in the south, in the, in the western side of the country? What can we do to improve the social inclusion levels, get uh, population more ready for the climate shocks, and so to reduce that level of, of out-migration, because you don't know, we, we don't know where they're going either. So, and then how do you take into consideration, how do you prepare the North to, to deal with this in-migration and how do you strengthen the capacity of people, local government and government to deal with the climate-induced um, migration, the climate risks and the climate change that is happening in these regions. Uh, this expected from a climate change perspective, it is expected that the Northern area will be one of the, mo the, one of the main areas that will suffer the longest drought in the country. We can add to this, <clears throat> as we were talking about <clears throat> recommendations, we can add in this in Cameroon, you have very weak national government and local government, very limited decentralization processes. So how do we start thinking about building institutions as well investing in those institutions to take into consideration all these changes that are happening. So um, as I mentioned earlier, so with this data that we have, as I, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we, I always ask the, the questions of where are the people and who are the vulnerable people and where are they living? This analysis we just presented try, tries to, to exemplify that. Um, but I always also ask my colleagues to to when we are thinking about um, climate adaptation or how we start thinking about climate policies for adaptation, to not think about it sectorally, to not think about it, um, here's what we need to do on decarbonization and here's what we need to do on, on roads and this is what we need to do um, only from an urban sector, but to think more about it as socioeconomic systems where you have people at the center of it. Why is it a socioeconomic system? And if you take again the example of Cameroon, because one, one, the first pillar I think I would say of this, we have five systems, I would say. The first pillar of that is food. One of the major issues of climate change is malnutrition, is food insecurity. Um, it is the migration of people to secure better, um, better livelihoods for better food opportunities. So food is a socioeconomic system that puts people at the center of it. The second one is livelihoods and jobs, is what is the impacts of these high temperatures on, um, on farmers, on herders, on livestock, on fishermen? What is the expected increase of poverty and inequality um, on seeking better livelihoods and greener jobs? Um, what is the potential of increased conflict, especially in areas where we have high levels of fragility or conflict of violence, FCV is, is the acronym for that, fragility, conflict, and violence. And then what about opportunities for people to get better education and better health services and better safety nets to help them accumulate human capital so they are ready to enter the labor market um, stronger? Because as we know, a lot of times climate shocks really put a stress on, on people's ability to accumulate human capital, um, specifically um, educational attainment, specifically social protection schemes that will help them, that would lift them out of the poverty trap and help them to cope with shocks. Another, another socioeconomic system that I think is very important to look at, um, that we look, that I, I urge my colleagues to look at to where people are at the center of it is the natural resources. Because often we look at one of the major issues that we look at when we're talking about climate change and how, is how to put end to deforestation, deforestation. But deforestation is happening because it is being led by people who are searching for better livelihood opportunities. For example, in Cameroon, about 75% uh, 
uh, of people are actually in the agriculture sector. Um, and about one third of, of the deforestation is happening specifically because of this land use, less use change in forestry um, in, induced by, the, by, uh, by agricultural activities. Um, another aspect to look at is the physical infrastructure. And we have been talking about it um, quite as much today, but we're looking at what is the, what is the access to, to sanitation in urban areas versus rural areas, and how do you prepare people for that? How, what is the impact of high sea levels, coastal erosion on roads and connectivity and people's access to markets? especially in places like Cameroon, where you have high reliance on agriculture and access to markets to sell your products is very, very important. And lastly, another system that is very important to look at um, is energy. And we look at how do, you, how do you ensure that people's access to renewable and green energy is equitable and, and, um, and accessible for people in rural areas and, um, and in urban areas. And more importantly, um, is to ask how can we make sure behaviorally people are willing to, to take or to accept access to energy that are renewable and green. And so, <clears throat> and I would like, why I would like us to conclude by asking how will these results Inform, pol inform policy decisions and investment and sustainable opportunities for people. I think I, I don't want to put the question like this without um, framing it that um, in, in, um, in a way that we don't need the results to start thinking about people that are at the center of policy decisions and investments and, 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 and sustainable opportunities, right? But I think we need, the, we need to make sure that always the analysis is there because we need to always bring in the evidence. I think it has been taken so much for granted that people, since they are the beneficiary of a lot of these services, they would be taken, they are de facto included in the analysis. And, and, I, and I think that's not, that's not been happening. And so therefore, um, it's very important to lead this analysis and and do, do the necessary analysis to put people at the, at the center of, of, um, of these uh, policy decisions and investments. So why are these important? Because first of all, it's important to, when we're thinking about just transitions or what we're thinking about a decarbonized uh, world, to make sure that no one is left behind. And we have so many examples where we have um, made sure that our programs are focused on are focused on the needs of local communities. Um, we do a lot, as as uh, Jessica has mentioned. Um, I, in, in in my capacity, and I know a lot of other colleagues, we do a lot of community driven development programming, where we make sure that the financing is going all the way down to the community or to the county level, to make sure it's participatory enough, um, or I wouldn't say participatory enough, it's fully participatory. So women, elderly, um, uh, uh, young people, people with disability, all are included in the uh, participation process. And they are all taking um, or taking part in their local uh, investments that are designed for their own community or county. Um, a recent project I, I just was working on where we need to, where we make sure that it, more than 90% of the whole financing of the project goes down to the community or to the county level. This is a huge number because usually all these nationally, national projects keep a, a very big cap on the national level, but this is what we're starting to think about. We're thinking more about making policies more inclusive and, and thinking more locally. A better, uh, a, a second reason why we need to start putting people at the center of this is we need better targeted, um, targeted development centered climate investment. This is a very big sentence um, and I always struggle to say it, but I think it's a lot of words that we're trying to say, um, 
we need to make sure that these climate investments are targeted for the communities that these investments are intended to. Um, we're not talking about climate investments that are green. No, we're talking, we're talking about climate investments that are green, that respond to the needs of these local communities. And as you saw from the example in Cameroon or where I work in, in Africa, West in general, I work in a lot of these conflict affected countries where the needs are differentiated and all these climate investments will need to take into consideration the impacts and the drivers of climate, uh, the impacts and the drivers of conflict to make sure that these investments are targeted to these communities. One of the biggest examples is we see, for example, in Northern Cameroon, with every climate shock, we see increased of conflict between farmers and herders. Um, and, we, and that makes the whole area more and more um, in a spillover of conflict one year after another. So how do we take those drivers? What is creating those, those, what are the drivers of those conflicts that is making the recovery from one climate shock to another harder because of this repeated cycle of conflict? And third, thirdly, I think for us, building communities resilience to climate impacts um, and promoting newer, greener jobs and livelihoods for people. So a lot of these projects, the reason why we're putting the people at the center of the analysis is because when you're, th when you're thinking about people's approaches, a lot of times the thinking is more on a household approach and a targeted household approach. But when we're thinking about climate action or we're thinking about recovery from climate shock, it's often, the work is often on the communal level. It's the neighborhood that is coming together. It's the association that is coming together. It is a more the county that is coming together. Um, so how can we make these community systems more resilient to these climate impacts? Thinking about them about more than just the household intervention and thinking about it more as a collective action to make sure that they are strong enough that after these after climate shocks and after a long exposure of climate change, they continue to promote new, um, new greener jobs and more sustainable livelihoods for all people. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to present some of this thinking that we're doing, um, that I'm doing right now on, on people-centered approach for uh, climate action. Um, as I mentioned, I'm not a planner, so I hope that um, we can find some linkages between some of this work that I'm doing and the work that you are all involved in. Thank you very much. And over to you, Jessica. Thank you so much, Donna. That was fantastic. And it gives additional context to the purpose pillar of the regenerative economy that Linda had described earlier. Um, and it's always nice to hear common themes, um, but coming from a slightly different lens and hearing, you know, from non planners. We are about to open the discussion up to Q and A. So please type your questions into the chat box, um, or just type your name if you'd like to come onto the screen to ask. Um, but while you all think of your questions, I would like to invite Tim Van Epp to reflect on some of the common themes we've heard today. Tim is the former chair of the APA International Division, as well as founder and managing director of Eurasia Environmental Associates. He has 30 years of experience providing environmental consulting services to a wide variety of public and private clients internationally and in the US. Um, so welcome, Tim. With COP26 occurring right now, today's discussion feels extremely timely. Um, what do you see as some of the key messages of today's discussion? And how can planners realign their projects to put people at the center of climate action? Uh, thank you, Jessica. Um, good questions. <clears throat> um, first of all, um, just a reminder, um, most of the people online are planners. The American Planning Association is a group mainly of uh, local city planners or consultants um, to uh, local communities. And uh, our working group for climate and sustainability national division, hope ultimately will provide 
some education, some guidance um, that maybe some of these uh, webinars uh, can be translated into more specific uh, kinds of guidance, uh, information, methodologies, um, that kind of thing, depending on our, our, our capacity to do so. And um, so I, I have um, one or two questions for each of the three speakers. Uh, which I, I hope will reflect my my um, insights to to what we're talking about. One is um, as a planner, I'm as a regional planner. I'm particularly interested in scale, you know, global, national, regional, local. And for Linda's talk, um, she had that diagram from I, I guess it's the Climate Alliance or Justice Climate Justice Alliance uh, near the end of her presentation. And in the center of it, it showed um, the three uh, scales, um, you know, national, regional, local, I believe it was. And so I'm wondering, you know, whether any of those should precede or is, is a, a driver for the other two, whether they should all be occurring, you know, bottom up, top down, concurrently, um, you know, whether something is a precedent for another scale so that's one question um, for for um, Zach um, great talk you you did address climate um, as one element of your methodology dealing with children or with aging um, however I'm wondering if you could turn that inside out do if you were faced with a project to um, to make sure uh, a town gets an effective climate action plan. Uh, and one, one component of it is uh, equity. Can you do it that way? Or do you have to address it um, you know, as, as you have in these two examples as an overall um, you know, uh, project for aging or for children? And then um, thirdly, uh, with Jana's presentation, um, I'm, I'm interested to know, it, it's kind of a scaling question as well. Um, you know, the bank is doing this great work, um, but um, how close is the bank to um, mainstreaming or institutionalizing all the, the thinking you've been doing about what, um, you know, climate resilience means for different groups? And, um, you know, I, I do a lot of environmental impact assessments. So I'm familiar with, you know, how, how those are used by the bank to address social issues and to address climate issues. But <clears throat> is there guidance that the bank might be developing or criteria that, that they might be including in those assessments, um, which uh, address the, the particular nexus of uh, climate and equity? So those are my my three insights. Great, thanks. Maybe we could start with Linda. You ask a really hard question, Tim. And uh, well, one response might be to say, as is the cop-out adaptation answer for every question, it, it depends on the context. It's all very context specific, right? Um, I think the, the scale question is really challenging. Um, Krishna and I were also having a side conversation about how big the scale of the project should be, because there are huge debates about you know, the time, this, this kind of urgency and the scale and the magnitude of the ch challenge while we're also trying to be sensitive and transformative and doing all of that in a democratic society is really hard. So simultaneously, there are people asking, can, can democratic societies deliver this compared to authoritarian regimes, which is um, where the world appears to be taking a turn as well. Um, I, don't, I don't know um, which of those scales is going to be greater or, or more important. In some ways, we need all of those scales to become better at what they do. For the environmental challenge, uh, the regional scale has been, um, in terms of hollowing out this, the state, the regional scale has been gutted and eroded in many places or never strongly formed. And if we're trying to deal with large scale territorial spatial planning moves, but all our governance institutions are actually very fragmented, whether you're looking at Manila or, or 
um, or parts of the US. Some of the ones in Asia, of course, are more concentrated, but in Senegal, for instance, they just pushed through de decentralization regime um, reforms that splintered the city into even more fragmented small community governments. So trying to deal with these questions of managed retreat and relocation when cities are also being tasked to produce a lot of services to fiscalize land use, this is a real challenge. And I think that a major question that we haven't really asked is what kinds of, are, 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 are our institutions up to the task? And if they are not, what kinds of institutional reforms do we need to actually um, shepherd forward the project of a climate transition and at what scales. I did do a paper um, that was looking at um, the urban adaptation strategies in various South and Southeast Asian cities and how they impacted the more rural peripheries. And I think that we often in terms of that scale have these um, ideas that urban is urban, rural is rural. But when you look at migration flows of disadvantaged people, they really move over time and across space from urban to from rural to urban and back out to urban areas. So a city might take rural areas water in order to create the big cities and their capacity to produce and house. And all those people that have who, who now have lost water end up being dis, um, dispossessed of their agricultural capacity and they move into cities. And once they're in cities, they also get disadvantaged and dispossessed of any right to land or housing or water. And then when there is a big flood or a storm, they're the first ones to become evicted back out to the periphery along with floodwaters on rural areas because they're not perceived to be um, the target beneficiaries. So I think that um, in terms of rescaling, there's also opportunities even for our networks of social justice movements to shift from um, one that targets mostly a spatial multinational transnational networks to thinking more spatially um, and territorially to create the movements within countries to change how those um, debates and discourses are held. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, I mean, your question kind of uh, you know, climate and also explicitly equity concerns were sort of nested within a broader sort of thematic um, on on aging and demographics. I mean, I think one thing that really stood out to me from this work and, and the focus of, of, of some of these projects was the importance of that sort of narrative component and the sort of communications roles that some of these materials played in terms of um, building buy-in and finding um, points of alignment across, um, you know, different different agencies with with a range of agendas. And I mean, you're, you kind of asked, is it does it have to come, you know, from one side or the other in terms of, you know, an explicit climate or equity focus, or does it have to be nested within a sort of um, broader frame? I mean, I think. I think from my perspective, in terms of translating some of these, um, you know, principles or case studies or recommended actions into, um, you know, tangible steps forward on the ground in these, in these locations, um, there is a sort of, um, you know, task of seeing what, what venues or, or channels are available in that context for, for making change of any type, you know, is the city working on a uh, you know, equity assessment for a mobility plan, or are they investing in, um, you know, um, urban greening and, and stuff like that. And so I think some of the framing and narrative considerations um, often have to uh, be around sort of finding alignment between, um, um, you know, sort of dominant um, activities in an area and, and some of those additional, additional, um, you know, principles that you're trying to to implement and and get embedded in these um, in these projects, I think. Um, I mean, just in terms of uh, what you mentioned about um, a sort of explicit climate or equity perspective, I think. I think one of the focuses of this work, I'll just add, is that like um, I think the idea is that this would be a resource that is then really focused on um, you know localizing that work and. And taking it um, into settings where 
um, you know, the priorities or experiences or existing successful practices of, of local, of local groups can sort of be, be brought to that, that work. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Jana. Uh, thank you very much for your question, because I think it's, um, <laughs> it's, um, I think you know the bank a lot better than me and it takes a long time to institutionalize things like this. But I think there is a question that is being put forth by our leadership, uh, by the senior leadership at the World Bank and about how do we think about a people-centered approach from climate for climate action. Um, and so all this work that I shared with you is all the work that we're doing to actually start saying, this is how you start doing it. Um, and this is will be shared with the high leadership to basically tell them this is what we know and this is the analysis that we know. Um, and this is and this is how you need to start asking those questions about people because if and, and being very honest and transparent with everyone, whenever I would pick up a climate um, uh, climate change report from the World Bank, um, it's always talking about climate change, but we're not understanding what is what is the impact on people who are the how are their vulnerabilities changing because of this climate, because of the different climate shocks? I'm very much interested in looking at people's resilience between one climate shock to another over a period of time. And so taking multiple shocks and you see there, how much can they access job opportunities, education services, um, connect, connectivity, roads and connectivity to markets, uh, participation in community organization, taking it over a long period of time and see how this access changes from one shock to another over a, a long period of time. And you see what is their coping mechanisms and the resilience are how they are being impacted by these different shocks. And, and, the, th and the hypothesis is that the, the collect collection of the, that the residual or the level of resilience decreases with every shock. And so therefore um, over a cumulative period of time that um, with, an, with one more shock than the resilience, then there's no more resilience to, to cope with anything. So it is a work in progress. Um, it takes time to institutionalize anything. Uh, so, but the more the merrier with these voices. <laughs> so if you're doing anything for the bank on an environmental social assessment, please make sure to ask these questions and see if they're being done because the only change, because people, if they don't hear the questions or because our, our task team leaders, if they don't hear the questions, then they won't do the work and, um, and it's important to raise these questions. So thanks. Well, thank you. So are there other questions from the uh, attendees here? Um, on my people, lines or anybody's lines? <laughs> people seem to be a little bit um, slow. Yes. I know it's been a, a long, fun day, but um, Huang, I can see your hand up. Um, do, do you like to come in? Yes. Uh, hopefully I can ask one question that address all three presenter, especially, and thank you again, um, you know, for presenting your work and in, especially in the idea of like, um, uh, Jenna not being a planner, but the, the, was it C. Wright Mills, sociological imagination, you know, how do you address the personal problem of individual and also address the greater, um, issue, public issue of climate change. So, uh, there's definitely, um, difficulty in I, I see in your work and even how it elapsed in my work because I am a, P, a PhD researcher also but for example I live in New Orleans so there's a lot of uh, interconnection between the three presentations for example uh, the idea of, of scaling um, uh, we just submitted or will submit this month the repetitive loss error analysis it's a three-year project but we're doing it at the kind of national level the NFIP and CRS but trying to apply it to the local, even the individual property, and that scaling is difficult. Uh, even working with people who um, uh, we consult with that understands the national, but they, they don't understand each neighborhood, how the policy might affect each neighborhood. So that's difficult. Even something as learning, I remember we, we did an outreach uh, with the water collaborative and, and the city and, uh, and a, a bunch of uh, private and public sector. I think Dana Brown was there, but. I mean, something learning, something as simple as like, uh, we talked to a teacher and then she brought up an important fact of like, you know, the idea of justice and equity. Um, she knows exactly which kid 
will not show up when it rains because that, that block they're on is flooded and they might have one car or the parents can't drive them, things like that. And those days adds up. And those days add up where they, they drop out of school, you know, and, and when they get to middle or high school and not go to college and they come on this kind of like, you know, um, what do they call it? Um, uh, pipeline from, you know, school to prison, you know, and this, this is a big issue where something in flooding that affects greater sociological problems that people don't see connected. But without having that kind of uh, inductive discussion instead of policy deductive, like, you know, how do you do uh, pipes, you know, uh, the, the, um, for example, the uh, Corps of Engineers SILA project, those things, they look at a pipe and they don't quantify the people. They quantify how much water does that canal pumps out and, and they don't look at the individual, you know, something as a kid not being able to go to school, you know, uh, because it rains. So how do you, how do you take, I don't, I don't think there's the greater scale is, is one way or the um, smaller scale is another way. How do you gap those kind of problems when you have to do multiple tiers, multiple levels, you know, and solving once again personal problems and greater policy issues? I'm happy to jump in quickly if <laughs> um, that's okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think that's that's a really interesting point and and highlighting the the sort of point of scaling across the three presentations and I think you know that was a huge kind of consideration in in the New Orleans work like uh, in terms of taking some of the you know high level thematic work the consideration or priorities of agencies across the city and then kind of bringing that down to a workshop context where you're you know you're talking to people like what does it look like when you walk from from school to your house um, and you know bringing people in into the same location to kind of talk through those multiple scales all together and to think about um, you know what kinds of activities you can design where people will be sort of shifting their perspective and sort of seeing that that daily walk, but then also sort of seeing um, you know priorities on a citywide infrastructure level, and then combining that um, you know bridging that to to themes that might apply globally as well. I think your question echoes Tim's question to me as well in terms of scale. And this is a perpetual struggle in terms of the vertical versus the horizontal. And the, the higher levels of the horizontal are never going to be able to know what's going down at the local level. And that is not their job. So the challenge is what is it that these different levels can do to integrate horizontally in a way that enables sub-national levels to do their work more effectively. And that is just a perpetual struggle no matter how your country is organized. So some countries are unitary and they have line ministries. They have a struggle of making things tie together at a horizontal territorial scale even more. And then federal countries that have the state's model, they similarly have those challenges of coordination, but in a different way because they don't have the strong vertical lines coordinating between different levels. Um, so in the US, I see this kind of challenge where at the local level, for instance, we have really strong silos between housing production, disaster risk reduction, transportation, water infrastructure, and they all do their work separately. So for instance, in our work with floodplain buyout programs, they can get better at what they do to make communities become more equitable or more um, have greater access to the floodplain buyouts so that the process is more humane and more community driven, but they don't control the piece that said why that community got permitted to live there in the first place, why they got no infrastructure over the last 30 years, or where they're going to go if they get relocated because they're not in charge of affordable housing production. So I think the, the challenge for these kinds of more ever more wickedly interconnected um, planning problems is how do you create these both structural and informal networks to enable people to create the infrastructure, the institutional infrastructure necessary to do that work. And I don't have a great answer for how to do that, except that there's lots of experimentation that we could be learning from right now. I actually, I will just add on that on the importance of 
um, of looking at the vertical and the horizontal, uh, because interventions happens on happen on both level, and it's also important to think about um, if you're thinking about a people centered approach for climate action or climate adaptation, um, they are impacted by, by these two. And it's important to always, it's not one way or not. So it's always important to, to know that it's not one intervention, it's not two interventions, it's a, it's a system that imp impacts that. Um, and, and you need all of them, but, and at the same time, it's, um, it's where is the starting point? So from my work, I do most of my work, the starting point is on the local level. Um, that's what I focus on, but I make sure that I'm working very closely with my urban colleagues who are thinking about uh, more urban centers and metro centers and, and how do they work with, um, how are they thinking more about city level systems. And I also make sure that I'm working with my governance team that are more thinking about the institutions and thinking about how do you make sure that this money that I need on the local level will actually flow all the way from the national level to the local level. Um, and so it's a, it's a system that is very interconnected that would need, you would need to look at it on both, on both sides. It's not, the answer is not straightforward, unfortunately. Thanks, Donna. Um, we have a question um, from Krishna. Tim, I might direct this one to you actually, unless um, anyone else knows, but what is the difference between wood-fired cooking versus natural gas versus electrical uh, cooking stoves on climate? Uh, the impact of how and where it is implemented can make a difference. Well, very technical. <clears throat> Tim, this is Michael. Um, I actually wrote my grad school thesis, but thesis on this to actual topic. Um, interesting. Go for it, so on a climate issue, uh, wood fired would be the worst, but yeah. I think on a global scale, um, it's really insignificant. These are insignificant uh, sources of pollution on a global scale. For pollution, the bigger impact is on a local scale. Um, you have a lot of respiratory health issues, for example, in, ref in, in, in cooking, uh, in refugee camps because of um, local how, of cooking fuel and how people and where people are cooking, uh, people are being trapped in tents um, with uh, fire and, and coal and stuff like that. But these are also complicated issues. So for example, in a lot of places where they pushed, um, in some places where they pushed uh, solar cookers, uh, like such as in East Africa, solar cookers, in, in many cases, the solar cookers that they've passed out don't cook in Jira. They don't get hot enough and they don't, and they're not the right shape to cook in Jira. And if you can't cook in Jira in East Africa, you, you know, you're not feeding anybody. So these are some pretty complicated issues. And it actually really speaks to the need for community engagement in helping to make good decisions for communities in terms of cooking fuel, energy use, um, and the types of things that they do. So yeah, I, I agree on, on electric, um, you know, it depends in part on the source of electricity. Um, you know, if you're able to opt for a, re a renewable energy source, um, then, you know, that improves um, the greenhouse gas uh, situation for electric. Um, I'm also thinking, again, about scales. Uh, in, in Beijing, for instance, um, we did an ADB project uh, about 20 years ago. There are, uh, was a lot of use of coal briquettes on an individual residence basis for cooking and heating. And uh, it was causing a lot of pollution. And you could, you could say that's local pollution, but um, it's uh, kind of a cascading issue or, or um, an exacerbation of the air quality issues in Beijing uh, to begin with um, during the winter, you know, with the, the uh, particulates coming from the, the Northwest of, of Beijing. So then you're, you're mixing different kinds of pollution, you know, particulates and other coal, coal based um, uh, pollutants. So uh, it's not always easy. I don't know that you can always separate local from regional. 
Thank you, Michael and Tim. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, so a big thank you to everyone. Um, and one final plug before we close. Uh, this session was hosted by the APA's International Division's new Climate and Sustainability Working Group. Um, as Tim mentioned, our goal is to bring overseas innovation in resilience and climate action planning to American planners. Um, this is our kickoff event, um, but we are planning to host bi-monthly um, meetings and webinars beginning in 2022. And if you'd like to join that group or learn more about it, please contact the International Division. But a very big thank you to our speakers and discussants, um, everyone who joined, and to the American Planning Association. Uh, this has been a fantastic talk, um, and I really, really enjoyed it. So. Thank you and happy planning, uh, World Town Planning Day again to everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night.